Hello, everyone, and welcome to Last Week in the Church. I'm John Allen, the editor of Crux, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. You can find us online at cruxnow.com. Also the host of this show, which is kind of the show where we raid the journalistic fridge, right? We, we take out stories that are a few days old, but we throw them in the skillet, sprinkle over some spice and our secret Crux brand sauce, and serve it up piping hot. Here's what we've got for you this week. The Cardinal in the Clink. China arrests 90-year-old Cardinal Joseph Zen, raising questions not only about Zen's personal fate, but also the future of relations between Beijing and Rome. Next, conclave fever. Pope Francis's ongoing health issues have fueled a new bout of speculation about what might come next. We'll break it all down for you. Then, the still peripatetic Pope. Despite those health problems, the Vatican has confirmed two major trips for Pope Francis in the month of July, an early July trip to South Sudan and Congo, and then a late July trip to Canada. We'll explain what that all might mean. And then finally, much ado about Malta. The tiny island nation, despite its small size, is a kind of laboratory for the future of relations between the church and secularism. That's what we've got for you this week, so we're going to take a very short break. Please stick around. All right, we begin this week with news during the past week of Cardinal Joseph Zinn's arrest by Chinese authorities in Hong Kong. Zinn was arrested along with several other, other figures who were part of a pro-democracy group in Hong Kong. They are being charged with favoring foreign influences, foreign powers in Chinese affairs. And this is all justified by the new national security law in Hong Kong, which at the time of its adoption Many critics predicted it would be the end of Hong Kong as an autonomous entity within China. That situation seems to be playing out. Zen's arrest, again, bear in mind the man is 90 years old, has generated widespread protest around the world. The Vatican reacted by saying in a statement that was released on the day of his arrest, that it has received the news with alarm and it is following the situation with what it described as extreme attention. Not quite sure what extreme attention means, but in any event, that was the statement. Now, here's the thing. I think the Zen arrest illustrates a couple of points that are worthy of being sort of taken apart here. One, is the gap between the Vatican and the rest of the Western world when it comes to China. Most other Western governments issued statements after Zen, uh, by the way, we should say that Zen, shortly after his arrest, was released on bail, so he's not currently in a Chinese prison. Nevertheless, he does face these charges. Presumably, there will be some kind of prosecution. And if that prosecution is successful, he could end up with a jail term. Now, most other Western governments issued statements of, well, using rhetoric that was kind of highly charged. I mean, the Biden administration in the United States certainly did so. Other Western governments did so. Yet, by way of comparison, the Vatican statement at Rizin's arrest seemed somewhat muted. The South China Morning Post carried an article by a columnist claiming that the Vatican wasn't shedding any tears over Zen's arrest and basically suggesting that the Vatican was being overly silent, overly deferential to China when it comes to the fate of Cardinal Joseph Zen. And, and this may create a situation going forward in which the Vatican is well, let's just say out of step with other Western governments in terms of 
trying to make the case for religious freedom and particularly for the fate of Cardinal Zinn as this prosecution moves forward. The other thing we're saying is that the arrest kind of shows that China just doesn't get (laughs) the Catholic Church, certainly doesn't get the Vatican, in the sense that before they arrested Cardinal Zinn, Cardinal Zinn had done a fairly good job all by himself of isolating himself in terms of any influence on Vatican policy when it comes to China. I mean, remember that Cardinal Zinn not so long ago publicly called Italian Cardinal Pietro Paterlin, the Vatican Secretary of State and the Pope's top deputy when it comes to foreign policy. Zinn called him a liar and said that he was lying about the Vatican's deal with China over the appointment of bishops. He also has serially accused the Vatican of being naive and of not understanding the nature of the Chinese regime. None of that went down particularly well with Pope Francis or the team around him. Further, Cardinal Zinn has also increasingly aligned himself with other critics of the Francis papacy, most prominently including Archbishop, Italian Archbishop Carlo Maria Viganò, the former papal nuncio, that is, ambassador to the United States, who has become the premier thorn in the side of the Francis papacy, rather. Not so long ago, Cardinal Zinn pinned a letter claiming that the coronavirus was being exploited by unnamed forces to promote a kind of dictatorial one-world government and to under, undercut personal freedoms. That letter was co-signed by Cardinal Zinn. So this identification between Zinn and the kind of Vigano camp in the church also didn't exactly boost his stock with Pope Francis and the people around him. So the truth of it was, prior to this, Zinn had kind of been frozen out of the senior levels of the Vatican. In fact, you may recall that not so long ago, when Pope Francis had to appoint a new bishop for Hong Kong, that's Zinn's former diocese, Zinn traveled to Rome to try to make a case with Pope Francis for appointing somebody who would stand up to the Chinese. He couldn't even get a meeting. Pope Francis wouldn't even put him on his calendar. That's an indication of of what an outsider he had become. Now, however, the calculus has changed dramatically. Now, Zinn has the sympathy of the entire world because there is a perception, and probably not an inaccurate perception, that the Chinese have, uh, have come after Cardinal Zinn, not because he actually poses a threat to China's national interest, but rather because he's simply a dissonant voice the Chinese don't want to hear. And, and that has created a groundswell of support all across the Catholic world. I mean, I will tell you this, that if Cardinal Joseph Zinn were to travel to Rome today, it would be basically impossible for the Pope not to receive him, not to find time for him. And the net effect of this is to make Zinn, to invest him with a kind of moral credibility as a victim of the Chinese communist regime that gives him far greater throw weight in Catholic affairs than he enjoyed before all of this happened. So the bottom line is, you know, the Vatican is often accused, among other people, by Cardinal Zinn of not understanding China. This may be a case in which China just doesn't understand the Vatican and doesn't understand the politics of the Catholic Church. You know, we will see where all this moves going forward. As I said before, it would appear that China intends to prosecute Cardinal Zinn under the terms of the National Security Act. Now, whether they actually will throw a 90-year-old Catholic prelate into jail remains to be seen, but it's certainly not out of the question, which means that the Vatican is going to be living with this question of the fate of Cardinal Zinn for quite some time. 
This may also, in the long run, call into question the Vatican's infamous deal with China over the appointment of bishops. You will remember that several years ago, the Vatican signed a deal with Beijing. And the, the terms of that deal have never been made public. So we're all operating in the realm of speculation, but the basic outlines are fairly well known. The basic outlines are that the Vatican gave Beijing a significant measure of control over the appointment of future bishops in China. And in exchange, the Vatican got a kind of concession that those bishops would be recognized both by China, that is the Catholic establishment in China and the Chinese government, and also by the Vatican. The, the fear was that if nothing had happened, you would end up with a de facto schism in which almost all the Catholic bishops in China were not in communion with the Pope. And you know the fear was that Rome would have lost any leverage at all in terms of trying to influence the, first, the future of the church there. So this deal has been on the books. It was recently renewed both by the Vatican and Beijing. Cardinal Zinn has been a ferocious critic of that deal. And it may well be that going forward, many Catholics may start asking themselves, well, if China is gonna throw a 90-year-old cardinal into jail, what exactly are we getting out of this deal? That is, what are the benefits for the Catholic side? And that may be an increasingly hard question to answer. So in other words, the Vatican may, be, may find itself pressed not only to engage the fate, the personal fate of Cardinal Zen, but also the broader fate of this deal, of which Zen was probably the leading critic. All right, shifting gears. Conclave fever. Here's the situation, ladies and gentlemen. In the Catholic system, popes don't have term limits. There aren't, you know, regular elections for papacies. Really, there are only two ways for a papacy to end. One is with the death of the current pope, and the other is with a resignation. Now, there are no signs at the moment that Pope Francis is contemplating resignation. There are, there are however, some signs that his health has been compromised. We have seen in recent weeks the Vatican cancel a number of public appearances of the Pope due to what has been described as severe knee pain, kind of osteoarthritis of his knees. We have also seen that it, he has appeared for the first time in public in a wheelchair at some of the public appearances he has maintained. Now, of course, the truth of it is, osteoarthritis of the knee in itself, while it's annoying and it's painful, is hardly life-threatening, but these most recent issues have reignited speculation that there may be something else going on here that the Vatican hasn't disclosed. You'll remember it was just last year that Pope Francis went in for an emergency colon surgery. Twelve inches of his colon were removed. And it remains true that the doctors who treated the Pope never issued a medical bulletin to which they signed their own names. Now, the Vatican has said clearly that there was no indication of cancer, that there was no tumor involved. But the doctors involved in the treatment have never said that. And, and that omission, or that lacuna, I guess, has fueled speculation in some circles that there may be some deeper, darker, more serious health issue here going on. In any event, all of this taken together has prompted conversation about what might come next in the papacy, both among at least some senior figures in the power structure of the church, and also certainly in the press. I mean, both in the Italian and the English language press in recent days, there have been a number of pieces with speculation about who the next pope might be. Now, let me just say, all of this may well prove to be wildly premature. You know, I was here during the late years of the John Paul papacy, I got to Rome in the mid-1990s. John Paul lived another decade. He outlived 
many of the correspondents who were predicting his demise, and we went through several cycles of speculation about a transition before it actually became real. So I have no way of knowing right now how close we actually are to the end game. What I can report are the people who were being mentioned as possible successors. So among those who uh, are supportive of the Pope Francis papacy and want to see basic continuity, that is, they would like to see the basic agenda of this papacy continue into the next one, there is one name above all that looms large, that's Cardinal Matteo Zuppi. Zuppi, he's an Italian. He is a product of the community of Sant'Egidio, which is the, the favorite new movement in the Catholic Church of Pope Francis. Zuppi would be seen as a progressive, someone whose interests are social justice and interfaith and ecumenical dialogue. Those are both the main interests of San Egidio and also the main interests of the Francis papacy. So he would be someone that the pro-Francis constituency would very much be looking towards. Also on that list, I think you would have to put Cardinal Parolin, the current Secretary of State, who would be seen as somebody maybe a little bit less, what, a little bit less of a maverick than Pope Francis, perhaps a little bit more predictable and less turbulence, I guess, but nevertheless somebody who would continue the main lines of the Francis pontificate. On the other side, some people are talking about Cardinal Peter Erdo of Hungary, who would be seen as more conservative than Pope Francis. Others have mentioned Cardinal Johannes Eich of Holland. Still others are looking at perhaps Canadian Cardinal Mark Ouellette, even though he's going to turn 78 this summer. Hey, let's remember that Pope Benedict was elected at 78. Pope Francis was elected at 76. So the mere fact of being elderly isn't necessarily disqualifying. Now look, I have no idea if any of these guys I certainly don't know if they're going to be the next pope. I don't even know if they're going to be taken seriously as a possible next pope. What I do know is that those are the names floating through the ether right now. All I can tell you is stay tuned, because this is the dynamic of the Catholic system. Whenever a sitting pope's health appears to be compromised, for whatever reason, there is inevitably going to be a bout of speculation about what might come next. Whether that's actually going to happen in the near-term future is anyone's guess. Now, the peripatetic pope, because, you know, despite the health difficulties we just talked about, nevertheless, Pope Francis appears determined to press ahead with a fairly ambitious travel schedule for this summer. Now, the Vatican already pulled the plug on what was projected to be a June trip to Lebanon. That because the, the talk is that the Pope's knee simply wouldn't have supported it. According to the doctors training the Pope, he needs at least 15 days of solid rest. He's also receiving injections for the problem in his knee. And the idea was that that was not going to be cleared up in time for him to go to Lebanon in June. However, the hope still is that it will be cleared up in time for him to make these two very ambitious trips in July. So from July 2nd to the 7th, Pope Francis is scheduled to be in the African nations of South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And then from July 24th to the 30th, he's scheduled to be in Canada. Let's take each in turn. So, the trip to South Sudan and Congo. Well, first of all, the Congo is one of the largest Catholic nations in Africa. It is largely French-speaking Catholicism. It is tremendously crucial in terms of Catholic fortunes on the African continent. And so there's an obvious reason for the Pope to want to go to sort of deliver a shot in the arm. South Sudan, while comparatively much smaller than the DRC, 
is nevertheless symbolically a cornerstone Catholic nation because it was the Catholic Church that really was in the vanguard of the independence movement that separated South Sudan from Sudan. It was Catholic radio that was the voice of the independence movement. And in a way, it's a test case of whether Catholic social teaching can actually make a difference in terms of politics, culture, and social life on the African subcontinent. So, a very important trip that Pope Francis appears determined to make. Now, as far as Canada goes, the Pope has indicated he is going to visit three places in Canada. He's going to be going to Edmonton, Quebec, and Inquilite, which is a largely indigenous city in the far north of Canada. It's got a population of about 7,000 people, 7,400, I think, in the last census. It is located on an island that is roughly equidistant between mainland Canada and Greenland. It's going to be, assuming Pope Francis gets there, one of the most remote locations a pope has ever visited. He's going there because it has a largely indigenous population. The, the city, well, if you can call the place of 7,400 a city, any event, the place, has a population that's about 60% indigenous. And Inuit, which is one of the indigenous groups in Canada, that's the majority language in the city. And the, the whole motive of this trip to Canada is largely for the Pope to try to repair the relationship between the church and the indigenous community of Canada that has been badly damaged by revelations of sexual, physical, and psychological abuse in church-run residential schools. The, the story here is a depressing one, that in the 19th and early 20th century, there were residential schools in Canada where indigenous young people were forcibly removed from their families and put into these schools and then subjected to multiple forms of appalling abuse. These revelations have generated widespread outrage in Canada. Not long ago, a delegation of indigenous persons from Canada came to Rome they had almost a full week of meetings with Pope Francis, which is an indication of how seriously he is taking this because, I mean, visiting heads of state, the, the president of the United States gets like 45 minutes with the Pope. He gave almost a week to these indigenous groups to try to hear their stories, to express his sorrow, his determination to try to get this right. And obviously his his drive, his desire to go to Canada in July is also another indication of how personally important all this is to Pope Francis. Now, the plain fact of the matter is that the Pope is going to be, if, assuming he is able to make these trips, he may be somewhat limited in where he can go and how much he can do in the places that he goes. All depends on on where his knee is at a couple of months from now. But nevertheless, there is every indication that Pope Francis intends to make these trips, intends to go to these places, and will do what he can to try to improve the prospects of the church and the societies that he's going to be visiting. All right, finally, we end this week with much ado about Malta. My wife, Elise, and I spent the last week on the tiny island nation of Malta. We were originally supposed to go there when Pope Francis made his visit to Malta, but for a variety of reasons, we were unable to do that. So this was kind of a busman's holiday. We were one part trying to catch up on the aftermath of the papal visit, trying to take the temperature of the local church in Malta, I, and it was one part, I'm going to be honest with you, like also vacation. Like a high point came when Elise and I took a fishing charter and my wife, who was a champion angler, just utterly decimated the, the fish population of the island of Malta. I mean, I don't know what fishermen there are doing, but I'm sure they noticed the difference after she was done. But here's what I came away with. 
I came away with the impression that despite its extremely small size, I mean, bear in mind, the entire population of Malta is less than 600,000 people. I mean, it's basically the Kansas City, Missouri standard metropolitan area, right? And I come from there, okay? And by no means would I claim that Kansas City is a bellwether urban area for the fate of the entire world. And still, it's bigger than Malta. And yet, despite the diminutive character of the nation of Malta, it's basically a city-state. It nevertheless is fascinating for this reason. It is really the last corner of Europe, and Malta is part of the European Union. It's part of what we would think of as Western Europe. It's really the last place where the relationship between the Catholic Church and secular culture is still being negotiated. I mean, bear in mind the following. It was only in 2011 that divorce was actually made legal in Malta. It was only in 2014 that civil unions for both opposite-sex couples and also same-sex couples were adopted. It was only in 2016, that six years ago, 2016, that Malta abolished its blasphemy law, which made it a crime to vilify religion. And in virtually every case, that meant vilifying the Catholic Church. I mean, it was criminal in Malta to say something bad about the Catholic Church as recently as six years ago. It was only in 2017 that Malta adopted same-sex marriage. And as of today, both abortion and euthanasia remain illegal in Malta. Now, most observers believe it's only a question of time until those two things are legalized as well. But the question is, legalized how? And with which limits? And with which role for the Catholic Church in supplying alternatives to those lifestyle choices? Now, you know, those issues have been off the table in most other Western European societies for a couple of generations. But in Malta, they are still alive. They are still very much with us. What is fascinating is that Malta, under the leadership of Archbishop Charles Shakluna, who, let me just acknowledge right out of the gate, he's a personal friend. I, I knew him when he worked here in Rome at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, so I can't pretend to complete objectivity. But under the leadership of Archbishop Shakluna, the church there has adopted, well, what you might describe as a different strategy from the way the Catholic Church reacted in other parts of Western Europe when the process of secularization began. That is, Rather than fighting the transition to a secular society tooth and nail, Archbishop Shakluna's strategy is to try to show that alternatives are possible. So, in the press for legal euthanasia, he hasn't hired lobbyists, he hasn't gone to war in some kind of cultural fashion to denounce the proponents of legal euthanasia. Uh, instead, he has invested his resources in opening a hospice that will provide care to terminally ill patients and, and try to convince the society that there are reasonable alternatives to the legalization of what, what amounts to physician-assisted suicide. And it's the same on the abortion debate. He has decided that there will be no crusades. Instead, he wants to position the Catholic Church to be the leading organization in multi-society that will provide support to pregnant women, that will provide support to single mothers, to try to show that there are alternatives. In other words, the Shakluna strategy is to try is to avoid public polemics, to avoid cultural war, instead to opt for constructive engagement and the offering of alternatives to the lifestyle choices that are being proposed by secular culture. Now, whether that will work, I don't know. But it is a different strategy than the church has employed in much of the rest of Western Europe, where the estrangement between the church and secular culture is 
As Pope Paul VI, now Saint Paul VI, memorably said in 1975, it is the drama of our times. So keep your eyes on Malta. I think it is going to be very interesting to see how all that plays out. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all the stories we've talked about on the Crux site. Again, that is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com. When you're on the site, by the way, you will find a nice and easy, handy-dandy way to make a financial contribution to Crux if you are so inclined and if you have the means. We would be deeply grateful. It costs us money to keep the site operating. For that matter, it costs us money to provide this show to you every week. And while we love doing it, we can't do it indefinitely without financial support. So whatever you're able to do, I mean, even a small amount, you know, $10, $25, or a euro, it would be greatly appreciated. We would especially appreciate it if you can become a regular monthly contributor to Crux, to Crux because that gives us stability. It gives us the ability to make plans. So we would be infinitely grateful if you would consider that as an option. All right, we will see you here next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, my charge to you is stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.